Jack, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for making time for this. Yeah, for sure, man. Stoked to be on. Very stoked. Cool. Well, yeah, same here. Uh, I see you're sitting in your warehouse here. Uh, I want to talk to you about uh, your your company uh, as well as the band, if you're open to that. Yeah, of course. Yeah, love to. Yeah, well, I guess to, to start with, um, I feel like, you know, the past few years for the band have, I think, been good, but it seems like really with Baba Yaga, it seems like you've really had a breakout in the past few months, last year or so. Do you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, it's sort of, you know, a strange hour end because uh, when we put it into perspective of, you know, how long we've been trying to do it for, that it feels like people sort of finally on the same page as us and it's connecting a bit more. Um, especially when we dropped, I would say like uh, Agony, maybe a year and a half ago, two years ago. That's all kind of like start to get the ball rolling for like the new sound we're doing. And yeah, especially with Baba Yaga and Demolisher, it's, uh, it's been, to be fair, really humbling to, to yeah. see everyone sharing. And- I mean, the, uh, the Baba Yaga video has uh, two and a half million views as of now in like a month which is amazing for, you know, your genre. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure, you know. Um, it's, yeah, just stoked, especially to try and we, I just want to try and bring more people to the genre, you know, try and get people excited about it. Like uh, when I was younger and how fresh it was and everything and how stoked I used to get, you know, that's uh, definitely what we're trying to do. Well, what was, when is that? Is this like the MySpace years or? At the very end, so the end of MySpace. So like uh, the bands I really got into was, uh, yeah, towards the end of MySpace, it was like uh, in the UK, Trigger the Bloodshed. Do you remember them? I don't remember them. Oh, they're brilliant. Yeah, they're really good. They're brilliant. Um, Annotations of an Autopsy. Uh Uh-huh. And uh, Ingested back then were like yeah, really fresh face sort of band. And uh, yeah, for sure, like those bands. And then, uh, yeah, I found Suicide Silence and obviously the more like US or deathcore bands and just sort of fell in love from there and couldn't get enough of it. Right. Yeah. And and then, you know, as I've talked about in my videos, I feel like the genre got kind of a little just flat, you know, sort of formulaic to me. And then I think you guys and Brando Sacrifice, but really, especially, you know, like especially the stuff you guys have been doing lately and just like you're not afraid to be ridiculous. Yeah, I, honestly, I love you said that. Like, we just, I feel like everyone used to have a lot more fun with it. I yeah. feel like, um, you know, it was just as serious about the music and everything, but it was just people, you know, it's an extreme genre. And I think you can be extreme in a lot of ways other than just, you know, blast beats as much as I love them. Like, you know, I think there's so many things you can do to, to, to show, you know, grab someone's attention and show them like, yeah, having fun and just doing over the top shit. Like we, we just love it. Absolutely love it. <laughs> well, t- tell me about this video because this is one of the most ridiculous videos that uh, I have seen. I mean, you got tanks. You got anyone who hasn't watched this. You got you got to go watch it. There's, you know, Alex wrestling a bear and driving a tank, and I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, to, to be honest, we when we sit down, the harder we try to think of a video idea, we come up with nothing. You know, we, we went at every angle, and we just thought, um, especially with Alex, he wanted to represent Russia and and sort of play along the stereotypes while actually keeping it sort of his experience. And, you know, at the end of the day, I can't get a tank here to film, really. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. like, it, you know, I'm sure there's some place you can rent a tank out, but it's very Russian to be able to at right. a, just rent a tank and find a bear, you know, um, on a, a pretty small budget, you know? It, right. Yeah, yeah. It's just... Who do we, you know, who, who do we know that's got a tank? Oh, my uncle, he can hook it up. We'll just borrow <laughs> one from the army for a day. They won't exactly. miss it. And his next door neighbor's got the bear as well, if you want to include that. And so how, how did he get the tank? Um, it was just a contact through the videographer. He just, uh, on, just knew someone that did like tank rides and things like that. Honestly, oh, okay, just yeah. uh, like an old Soviet tank, I believe. And uh, yeah, he just uh, managed to set it up and it just came together nicely to be honest so uh, you guys were able to travel to russia no so i wasn't or- so i didn't actually perform in in the video um i'm just going for the basically got a visa now but where travels just come to a complete stop so uh, yeah cause, a- so who, who's in the performance parts then so we have um a guitarist called um dimitri oh and- okay and he's he's russian yeah. too yeah so he he Got sort it. of filled in um a few 
times you know before uh we really started touring and stuff like uh he was filling in for some sort of russian shows he's like a he's a good friend of the band sort of you know known us from the start and he's just sort of flew in and, and jumped on it um i mean even still he still had to fly in it was like a six hour flight from one end of russia to the other just to go go do it right so uh, tell me about how you ended up connecting with alex because you know being in an international band that's that's complicated yeah, yeah but he is definitely a star in a way that you know i think not many people in the genre are so how did you guys end up coming together so i i've been in band since i was like uh i think about 12 years old um and i'm about 26 now and basically what happened was i was just going through it you know in this band that band touring and doing all this stuff and i just saw this video of alex before i think it had like three thousand views or something and it was just him doing a cover an ingested cover i believe and it's just uh i just sort of blown away reached out to him you know not even in something serious just do you want to make some music together and we just sort of it just clicked it felt easier to write with alex across the internet than i felt writing with you know other people in person or in a studio it just it clicked so well that we just sort of went all right let's do it put a couple you know put an ep together put some singles together and uh we just took it a day at a time you know it, it definitely was costly touring was uh very expensive from the start and, and trying to make things work with with sort of visuals has always been difficult i mean same for the Baba Yaga video um but we've just honestly just taken it step at a time and it's never felt wrong it's just the whole time it's felt very smooth you know and we just try and make it work yeah um and i noticed one thing that was interesting is you release a lot of your videos on his channel rather than on the, you know, a slaughtered to prevail channel. Tell me about that decision. So we, we really, to be fair with me and Alex working, I just wanted to kind of give him the freedom, especially with marketing and, and where it goes and all this stuff to do what he wants. Cause his vision is very strong, you know? And, um, whereas I would take more of a backseat on that with, you know, with the imagery and stuff. And I would put more of my focus into the songs. He, it just felt sort of normal to have it on his channel to reach his fans as well as grow the band. And I mean, to be honest, that's something we've sort of fought for with um, our contracts with labels and everything like right, that. Right, right. Try and try and keep it there. There's so many fans of Alex that we want to hear slaughter and also bring those slaughter fans into to Alex's channel so they can see what he's doing as well and sort of just try and center everything a lot more. It's funny that. that people would fight about that when at the same time they also pay for premieres you know, on these promotion channels and stuff. It's like, well, you've got an opportunity for like a free one. Like, why would you not do this? Oh yeah, exactly. And, and his subscribers already like his vocals, you know? Right. So it makes, to me, it just made so much sense. And, uh, uh, I, to be honest, I never really properly thought about it. That is like a band, you know, our band stuff is on just his channel. Cause it just felt so right with it, you know? Well, people, yeah, people get very precious about this. You know, they're very, uh, they, to me, I don't care, you know, if I was in a band, I don't care where you listen to us or watch our videos, you know, I'm indifferent, whether if you want to watch it on TikTok or Instagram or YouTube or Spotify, I don't give a shit. I want to be everywhere that makes sense for the band, for the fans. And uh, if there's an opportunity to get in front of more people by being on one platform versus the other, then I want to do it. And it feels like a lot of bands hold themselves back by kind of coming up with these invisible scripts for themselves. Like, for example, they want to post the link to YouTube on Facebook instead of just posting the video. And it's like, well, why do you care where they're watching? Yeah. Oh, 100 percent. I think it's it's almost cutting off your face to uh, cutting off your nose to spite your face, you know? Like, right. Well, we you know all the views in one place. Why? Yeah, exactly. You know, I, like you said, especially with platforms, I think right now we're in this golden age where each platform sort of hits a different target. You know, like mm -hmm. I feel that especially with TikTok coming into it a lot more and just the level of new people you can reach in different ages and everything, it's just, it makes no sense, you know? And I think it's also a sign that the industry in a way is always a little bit slow. It seems to actually keep up with trends and to keep up with, with getting it out there. And I, I see other genres, um, especially like SoundCloud rap and all these other ones where there's no shame. There's no shame in going viral on TikTok or anything. Right. Or no shame in 
in using whatever you can, Instagram, whatever it is to do it. It's just in metal. We have this sort of two cult sort of culture. Yeah. People, people are very resistant to TikTok. I don't understand why it's like, I mean, the, the audience is there. This is where kids discover music now. So I don't understand why you wouldn't want to be there. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's, there's no point. And I think also, I think it should even have the opposite attitude that it should be something exciting. Like we've, we've been looking at, especially with TikTok and, and seeing what's going viral. And, and obviously for us, it's a little bit difficult with the content we're trying to put sort of kept getting taken off. Yeah. Uh, but just try, trying to find that sort of truth of it all. Like for us, it's exciting to know that there's a new platform with an obviously younger audience and a younger group of kids that will love the genre or, or hate it, but we'll Either at least way, get yeah. it. Yeah. And that, that's all we want, you know, is to to bring that culture of the scene and everything to, to these people and try and find, not just find more people, but to really showcase what, what we're doing. Right. So you mentioned in the email you sent me, um, like reacts as a growth vehicle for you. And there's tons, you know, there's tons of reacts and tons of, you know, the vocal coach talks about Alex and blah, blah, blah. How has that worked for you guys? It worked brilliant. It, honestly, it worked just almost too well. You know, like it, it's sort of like you're waiting for the, the, the sort of catch, you know, almost like it, <laughs> for us, it's just, it just, just did like the right people, I guess, did it or the right song or whatever it was. And every day we're just seeing more and more of them go sort of semi-viral and getting a million hits just on someone reacting to the song already. Like yeah. the, the amount of extra views we're getting just for those channels was just uh, was brilliant. You know, it, it really was. I think that was one of the reasons that Demolisher did so so yeah, well. I think so. I mean, it's a ridiculous breakdown that's kind of just tailor-made for reaction videos. Yeah. You know, for somebody, oh my God! You know, I, I, I don't personally watch those. I don't really understand the appeal of it, but you know, like you said, there's people getting millions of views on them. So what do I know? Did you, uh, do you ever do anything like with reaction videos in mind or is that something that just sort of happened? It honestly just happened. So, I mean, with Demolisher, that track we wrote back in, um, probably 2016, funny enough. And, uh, I mean, back then maybe some people were doing it. I wasn't aware at all of, of reaction videos, but I don't uh, think so. Yeah, not really. Yeah. And I think even like writing now, you know, I'm even at the moment writing new, um, you know, slow songs. We just finished up the album that's coming out. And uh, it's just even then it's never really popped into my mind with songwriting, but I can imagine it will. I can imagine it will affect especially people, younger bands of how they're trying to get out there. I mean, if you just need one breakdown to sort of go viral and showcase your whole EP or your whole album. Right. I can imagine a lot of people changing how they're writing for that. I think so. I mean, look at this Lorna Shore song, you know, from whatever a week ago and everyone's freaking out about that breakdown. There's going to be tons of reaction videos to that. And it wouldn't surprise me if they get a similar kind of thing with Demolisher. Yeah, I can see that happening. I can see that. I think it also for, for this, like for Deathcore, you know, I think not everyone's going to sit there and listen to like a, a three or four minute song. So just to have that sort of those viral clips kind of get people in to actually give the music a chance is is great. It really is. Yeah, I think it's interesting with Deathcore, you know, with rap or pop, the hook um, for, uh, I would say, like TikToks is some sort of a lyric where people can do a thing that makes sense visually, um, you know, or, you know, that that's sort of the hook. But with Deathcore, where, you know, most of the time you can't understand the lyrics, uh, it's the breakdown that's the hook. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. It almost actually reminds me of a throwback to those MySpace days. Yeah. Like with the, the t-shirts used to have with the one liners and everyone had the one liner. Like where's every your fucking God. <laughs> yeah. Every single one. I, I think, uh, Martin Defile, the UK band used to be doing some great one liners. Like, and that was sort of their thing, you know? And, and, uh, I, I love that. I really did. And, uh, I think that's almost coming back now in just those. Yeah. Like you say, like with, with TikTok and those sort of clips like that, they're going viral and the vocals and, yeah, yeah. Suicide Silence were, you know, the kings of that to me. The, you know, the doctors recognize your face and, you know, pull the trigger, bitch, and all those. Yeah. You know, they go great on shirts and stuff. And yeah, it feels like with Deathcore, people sort of started to take it really seriously for a few years. And, and, and now people are like, you know what? Actually, it was cooler when we had fun with it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Definitely. And, uh, I mean, the bands coming through now, I think 
for me, I've been sort of more excited about them than I have for deathcore bands in a while. You know, I think we had like a, a short little bit of time when like Thy Art were coming through that it seemed to be coming mm-hmm. back again. And then it sort of, you're right, like kind of dipped, especially with people getting so serious. And and I think people still take like, like with our music and obviously like the new Lorna Shore track, the music really seriously. It's just yeah. that fun aspect, you know, like a horror film, like you, you're sort of waiting for that moment and that, that sort of over the top, explosive sort of crescendo moment that is going to, you know, finish off the song and, and, and just, yeah, it, it's great. It's really good. Well, I think you guys are showing that there isn't a trade off between having fun and doing, you know, ridiculous things visually. That's not going to make people take your music less seriously. Like you said, I mean, people are into the, people definitely take the music seriously. They are into it. It's not a joke band. Um, even though you have masks and do the silly stuff in the videos, did you guys ever feel any tension about that or have you gone in on that stuff since day one? Um, I wouldn't say tension. We've sort of been trying to think of, especially like, especially with the image, like, uh, we wanted to put as much work into that as the music, you know, we wanted Mm -hmm. a a full package. We love, yeah, bands like Kiss and obviously Slipknot is a, a huge, like, inspiration for us and even like what Ghost are doing, like, those sort of, we wanted to make it cinematic with the resources we had and also true to ourselves and, and the sort of things we like. And it just sort of came together quite naturally in that way. Um, we did play around with the mask quite a bit at first, like from the first sort of moment, we weren't too sure. Then we weren't sure if everyone should have one, like little things like that was sort yeah. of like, um, like little roadblocks of where we should take it. And it just sort of, you know, kind of grows with us and we've been trying to grow it recently you know especially for the album and the artwork and everything and and for future songs and what we've got coming up and especially when touring gets back together um we just want to make it that next level we want you to walk out like it's a new experience it's not listening to us on on spotify it's it's a full immersive experience of of us and the band and and everything in, in between sort of thing Yeah, like I think of My Chemical Romance as being a great example of this, of a band that has like a whole universe around them. There's like lore and, you know, it's it's almost like being a fan of a TV series or something like that as much as it is music. Yeah, Uh, spot on. Yeah, 100 percent. And I I love it. Like uh, it kind of like ignites an almost like kind of nerd part of me and it gets into it. And I like reading it and seeing all the videos and stuff. It's uh, it gets me gets me super stoked and pumped up. Yeah. Exactly. And you want people to talk, you know, like again, with your video with the tanks and the bears and stuff, people are, people want to know how that happened. And that just gives them one more thing to one more layer to dig deeper uh, and one more way to kind of nerd out and be fans. And that's what kids want to do. They just want to nerd out. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. So another thing you mentioned is your contract. So you said that you'd signed a contract in the beginning of the band that kind of made things difficult for you. And you've uh, I guess kind of renegotiated that. Tell me about that. Yeah. So, well, we signed to a label really just thinking that that's what we needed at the time. You know, we thought, okay, we've got this, you know, we, we've got the songs where we believe the songs and all that. And we just need a label to give us the platform. And uh, we started at, uh, our manager at the time um, with, you know, all, obviously all due respect, much love to him and everything. He, we were sort of his own only real band. He hadn't had much experience. So we're sort of going into it the same as each other, you know, trying to work yeah, it out. But you guys and, were a small band then too, so. Yeah, of course, yeah. And and at the time, you know, this was a great deal. Like the contract we signed, and I still think was a great deal for us at the time. It made sense, you know. But realistically, I think right now bands don't really need a label that earlier on, you know. Yeah. I think especially for us, you know. Like, uh, I don't know where we'd be at sort of if we didn't, but it definitely feels that there's so much you can do as a band before you need that, before you need the connections or whatever. There's so much you can do online for yourself, for your brand, for for everything. I mean, even music videos nowadays, you don't need a huge budget right. to make something interesting, to make something exciting, you know. Um, same with us. I mean, we've only spent maximum probably $4,000 on a video. Oh, wow. Uh, five, yeah, four or five thousand, really. Wow, and you guys have great videos. Thank you. Yeah, and 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 that's the thing. You can just, I think, you just got to get creative with it. It's the same with yeah. music. Like if creativity you put, is uh, free. Yeah, exactly. And 
it's fun. Like again, it's just having fun with it. It's not spending just so fifty much. grand on an album isn't going to necessarily make it a better album. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. And we fell into that trap too. You know, we fell into the trap of with our first album of cashing out on everything we could, thinking that's going to be it. We we're gonna absolutely, you know, just be everywhere, the place we want to be. And then sort of you realize as it falls around you, it's not really about that it's about you know obviously connecting with people it's about making something genuine exciting and and i believe if you make something you're excited about there's probably a certain amount of people you know Mm -hmm. on this planet that is going to be as equally excited as you and it's just finding those people for us well a lot of smaller bands you know they have this idea that if only they get signed and if only they have a manager if only this this like they think that there's some sort of magic thing out there where if they sign this contract with this person then it's all going to get handed to them and it's just not, it just doesn't work that way. I mean, if you're a little baby band, what is a label really going to do for you? I mean, they're not going to invest millions of dollars in marketing the band because you're a tiny little band. They're not going to give you a ton of money to record because you're a tiny band. I mean, there's really not that much they can do for you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and at the end of the day, everything also comes with a price. You know, I think yep. bands forget that what you have might not be so valuable right now but if you know if the bigger goal is is to create this huge thing that value is sitting there you know the potential value of that and and it's easy it's definitely easy to be sold down that street as well you know to be sold that if you come with us we've been given the talk when we were looking at labels you know before we signed to Sumerian like what we were hearing off people and the talks we were having was I oh, will get you here there and everywhere and then as soon as you actually ask them for it in writing in a contract, <laughs> running, it's suddenly a lot different you know what they can once the sales pitch has sort of calmed down a bit you know it is a lot different and i think bands just sort of need to sort of take that like you know responsibility onto themselves as well and just say you know it's a lot of stuff is out there just for you to go and get yeah i, can, I mean you anybody can make it. a tiktok account today and post stuff for free yeah yeah exactly and you, you i th- what i love about the internet really now with, with all the downsides and everything is you just see bands and artists get big in the strangest ways. Like I was yeah. watching one of your videos on the uh, hyper pop and mm-hmm. you said it is just a representation of the internet. It's not made to go viral on the internet. It's just sort of the sort of, yeah, it's the mirror self of it. And I think that's a brilliant way of putting it w- with all of this, you know, you can get big doing or popular, whatever, doing so many different things. And most of them really just come down to being really creative and new. Yep. And that's what's kind of seems fresh at the moment is like hyperpop is this new fresh thing and it's exciting. And I do wonder if it's going to sort of merge into metal at all um, or something, a me- you know, metal sort of version of that. Yeah. You know, but it just it just feels it feels good that people are getting creative again. Well, I think people it, it's interesting to me because although musicians think of themselves as creative and are creative, it feels like. A lot of them don't want to be challenged to be creative in ways that, you know, aren't just playing their guitar. It's like you said, everybody knows that there's all this stuff on the Internet, all these ways of getting the word about your music out there. But when you challenge people, it's like, all right, well, then go make a great video. They're scared and they don't want to. And and I understand why, because it is scary because you might fail and maybe you're not good at making videos, but that's the name of the game. You got to find a way. And if you can't do it yourself, find a friend who can, or like find fans who will do it or whatever. But like you have to be creative and resourceful and scrappy. And it feels like people just kind of want to run away from that challenge and make excuses instead. A hundred percent. Honestly, I I couldn't agree more to be honest. I think so much of the restraints, I think as artists that we put on ourselves is from our own mind and, and is from our own, you know, like you say, wanting even wanting like validation, but only in a certain way and not wanting to make a fool of yourself or not wanting to, you know, be classed as just a TikTok band or, yeah. or you know, just an Instagram friendly band. Cause the guys got tats. Like, I think you just got to see them as positives at the end of the day. If that t- makes more people listen to the music, then we've succeeded in that. And if, if it doesn't, then we'll try something else. And we'll, you know, as long as like, you, like you still stay true to yourself and what you're trying to do, I think it's, it's just, you can have so much fun. You know, there's so much resource out there right now. It's incredible. Yet not many people are really taking it for, you know, taking advantage of it. Yeah. It seems like in particular TikTok, the, you know, the heavier the band is, the less they're receptive to TikTok, I feel like. 
Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, but you you guys um you guys have had some success there. Is is that just kind of part of is that like an outcome of making great videos elsewhere or did you do anything kind of to seed TikTok or how has that worked out for you? Um we, to be fair, we didn't really ever push TikTok until recently. Um but it was just as we noticed that well, I I started noticing funny enough like just rappers and the uh, and, and obviously hyper pop artists and all that just connect on this weird level um, and songs I heard on TikTok mm-hmm. that I'm now hearing everywhere. And it's like, oh, I know that song, you know, and and I kind of just thought to myself that I'm surprised there's not been a, a metal band doing that. And then obviously the more I was looking into it, I was realizing that we had a couple of like um, reaction stuff that went viral on there and a couple of other things, uh, a couple of other pretty, you know, funny videos sort of thing, like almost sketch style right videos go up sort of you know semi-viral on there and we've never really yet pushed it until recently but i think that if i was starting a band now and i was looking at you know what bands are doing i think it's sort of one of the first steps just like making a facebook page or just like making an instagram i think one of the first steps is you've got to make that tiktok yeah pretty much yeah and i wonder if there's going to be bands like Maybe, maybe there are, but, you know, metal bands that write for TikTok the way that I know pop and rap artists do. That sort of, they're, they're like, okay, here's here's the part of the song that I'm going to put on TikTok and pay people to make reactions to that or make dances to this and stuff. I wonder when a metal band is going to do that because somebody's going to. Yeah, I, I'm surprised. I'm surprised it hasn't yet. And I think especially in metalcore, you know, I've, I've not really listened to much metalcore for a while. But I can imagine, especially in that sort of scene, someone doing that, you know, and, and doing something fresh with that. For sure. Yeah, Some, somebody will and they'll blow up and then everyone's going to realize they should have done it. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's just, there's just so much. I mean, I've complained about this all the time, but, you know, I'm going to allow myself to complain about it again. It's just so much excuse making. It drives me nuts. Like if somebody does get success on TikTok, then instead of people going, well, fuck, I should have done that. It's like... They just make excuses. Well, that wouldn't work for me because of this, or they were only popular because of that. And it's like, well, dude, just take the, like, instead of fucking complaining, take the energy you spent on that and make something on TikTok and you'll probably feel a lot better about yourself. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think, I think people put, they sort of put so much shame around, you know, if if you don't get popular via band camp or whatever or vinyl right, release right, and you right. haven't done it right you're not the true band you know especially in heavy music like just this what we see especially you know we don't i personally don't really read like comments anymore but before you just see a lot of trying to compare bands trying to compare this if you know oh you're meant to be a deathcore band why are you doing that you know or the one we get a lot is you're wearing masks you're just copying ghost or you're just copying slipknot like right. uh you know, so and, they invented and, the mask. Exactly. And I can't believe more bands aren't doing masks. Honestly, like the the way it connects with our fan base anyway is just like, it's just gold dust. It really is. Just yeah. the branding on it and everything is just, it's, it's a lot more than, you know, what I see other bands sort of doing at the moment. And it just seems like such a sort of golden nugget that, you could just do that. And it doesn't have to be a mask. It can be anything. It can be, you know, and I, I think Defco, we started to have it with the windbreakers. Do you remember yeah, that? Right, the, right. Yeah. The, the branded windbreakers yeah. and everyone's on stage jumping at the same time. That's the right. Up and down and, that was like and, annotations of an autopsy had that video, right? Where they're all in the windbreakers. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, dark days. I think it was yeah. a dark day. Movie. Yeah. Stage breaker. That's it. Yes. Yeah. I love that one. Yeah. It's brilliant. And like Oceano do it and, and it really worked. And then again, I feel like it just got stale. You know, I think especially in deathcore, a band does something different and uh, then you've got 20 other bands doing it the next week and, you know, and but no one wants to be the first band to do it until it's already been done. For sure. Yeah, well, that's how that's how it always is. And then they, you know, uh, and, and then they run it into the ground and people are going to find something new. But I, I do think it is interesting that something as simple as masks, you know, it doesn't, it could be a cape, it could be, you know, that you guys all wear yellow shoes. Like, it doesn't have to be anything amazing. And I think in your case, the mask is not like, um, 
you know, some people that take the gimmick so far that it sort of overwhelms everything else that they're doing, you know, like Eskimo Cowboy with Hypa Hypa, which obviously did well for them. But in my personal opinion, they took that so far that it makes them seem like a joke band. Um, and if yeah. and if they're OK with that, then, you know, that's cool. Um, but I think most people don't want to be a joke band. Uh, and that might be where their like resistance to things like masks comes in. But, you know, you guys have proven that it that the mask is just this little fun thing that you do that doesn't overshadow everything else. Yeah, for sure. And and, we, you know, we love horror films and it's not like if there's a new horror film comes out, you're going to shit the talk. Oh, you know, the main character or the villain or whatever's got this on is is sort of what you expect. Yeah, right. Oh, he killed someone with a knife. Well, I mean, all right. That's not the only movie where someone gets stabbed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and you're right. And there's still awful horror films where it's just gimmicking. It's not actually done in a in the right way. And and I'm sure if everyone started doing masks, it would be the same way. But yeah, it's just to me, I think there, there needs to be something else to it, you know. And if you just want to make music and just put it out there, much respect for that too, you know. But I sure. think there's, for me, I just have a huge passion for these songs that I just, I want the whole world to hear them, you know, I really do. Whether you like it or don't like it, I want a reaction. Um, yeah, positive or negative. And I just want everyone to hear it. That's it, you know, and, and and that's how sort of our ethos sort of is of how we try and approach things of what can we do? What can we do to maybe someone will hear us and get further into deathcore or death metal and, and end up loving Cannibal Corpse and sort of grow out of us, that's fine. As long as we could help them make that transition or maybe find something they like about it in the guitars or the vocals or whatever and and be able to get so into this music. Because I think this scene, the underground scene, has so much to offer that yeah. people just miss out on because they don't want to, you know, push it that far with it. So speaking of masks, that makes me think about merch, which I would imagine is probably a fairly important part of your business. And you run a merch company. Can you talk about kind of how you guys approach that? Yeah, for sure. Um, so when, uh, yeah, obviously we were, um, to be honest, because of the international thing, uh, money and revenue is pretty much vital for us to be able to tour. Um, and so... Meaning we, that your your travel costs and visas and all that stuff are yeah. a lot higher. Yeah. The expenses. I mean, the band, take, a, a, you know, a US band, and you've got a market you can tour and hit without visas and, and flights realistically. Right. And then you've got Europe and Asia and all this. Whereas for the guys, they just really have Russia. And there's not much money there and they're great shows, but it's very hard to make it work. So yeah. for us to, to generate the revenue to cover the expenses, to just to start a tour, just to get them here and get in the van with a, a you know a full tank of gas is expensive so you spent thousands of dollars on visas and flights and stuff before the first show yeah yeah and and we spend it months in advance as well that's the other difficulty i right. don't think many people talk about is it's not you know a week before the tour it's like six months you don't know if you but we've missed tours because we don't get them in time right and then the month gone down the drain and and it's just for us when we started approaching these merch stores to help do merch it's just the cuts were just insane like you know a 15 dollar t-shirt and we're getting like three dollars or whatever you know right. it's just crazy and and I, obviously it depends on designs and all that but yeah, we, we sold I 100 thought, shirts and we made 300 bucks wow e exactly and yeah exactly and so i just thought this can't be right you know and so i started doing merch for for us and i was like okay we'll cut out the middle man and then I sort of started looking into to printing costs. Okay, I'm realizing the company I'm using is also outsourcing here. All right, let's right. cut out as many middle and men as we can to get to what is the absolute minimum cost for a good quality T-shirt and to ship it and to sell it and, and what should the band get and what should, you know, I get for my time in it. And, you know, and we we have a lot of pride at, at Rise and Merch. We take a lot of pride of being able to pay bands a lot more and a lot of bands will say that, you know, they'll, they'll even say like, even though we're a smaller company and we're based in the UK, they'll just say, we, we just make so much more money. Right. You know, and, and I, I just want to help fund their album. That's it. You know, I just want to help. I want them to say, thanks to, you know, this company, we got, we managed to get, you know, someone else to mix it that might've been a little bit more expensive or, or start their tour on time with no problems or, or pay off a van debt or, or whatever it is. 
And yeah, it's interesting how many merch companies do outsource almost everything, and their role is to kind of be the project manager, which is, you know, that's that's okay. But like you said, there's a lot of, I guess I would say, inefficiency in there because they're paying thirty percent to their printer and then marking up thirty percent and all that, and it's just a lot of waste. Yeah. Oh, it's it's massive, and and you know, and I even say like to the guys in in the band. Um, sort of drummer and, and bassist when they say to me like they want more money and music i just say just pick up a job that we're paying someone to do you know yeah. talk managing or or even driving a van or whatever you know i'll happily we'll happy budget for you to do it instead of paying someone else and now you've got money in your pocket there's there's jobs in the music industry you've just got to go and get them and yeah and, and especially with with merch at the moment and designs you've seen a lot of people become designers mm-hmm. and you know, bands need a lot of stuff to make it happen accountants and all this and just Pick up a couple of things here and there. You've saved yourself thousands a year, yeah. And you're paying yourself a good, you know, a good wage for it. So, how many people are you working with? Uh, how many artists are you working with aside from Slaughter? Uh, we're working with about thirty. Okay, about thirty. Bands. Um, but we we've sort of lucky, very lucky to have grown to this point where we can sort of work with the bands we want to. So we'll hear a band and just sounds inspiring and even if they're not popular we'll, we'll try and help them we, we'll offer them um we, we've paid for sort of flights for bands to come over and you know recoup it we've we've even helped bands with debt just to recoup through their sales and try and you know i, I want to be a tool for the for the bands and for the artists to to use us almost like getting a loan from a bank and just help us promote the merch help us sell it and we'll handle the rest and we'll make sure, you know, you're, you're, you're on tour and you're getting opportunities or you're you're not stressing about debt because, you know, you didn't sell as much as you thought or whatever it is. You know, that that's all we want to take that sort of off their mind and, and actually help them. It's interesting that it really is kind of like a bank in that way. But a bank would, you yeah. know, probably not ever give them a loan like you would. That's well, not really a loan, <laughs> but an advance, I guess. Yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And um to be fair, that's, that's sort of what we take take pride in, you know. Yeah. And that's what I want to, as it grows, I want to offer that more, you know. With every sort of band we take on that ends up being successful and all that, we want to reinvest that money back into the scene. Well, I'm looking at your shelves full of stuff here. Um, one of the things that I'm always interested in with merch is uh, demand forecasting, because it's so hard to know what's going to sell and what sizes and all that kind of stuff. Uh, how do you approach that? Like, so let's say you're working with a new band and nobody really knows kind of what's going to sell. How do you think about that? So we, well, I look into, first of all, what sort of genre, what niche, you know, cause I think straight off the bat, there's just certain niches where it's just, there's a merch culture for it. You know, we started mm-hmm. working with and uh, tsunami mm-hmm. from California. Oh man. They, I bet they're a merch machine. Yeah, not not a big band, but I bet they sell a shitload of merch for how small they yeah. are. Amazing. Amazing. So for that, we, we do try and, and go, right, let's take a little bit more of a risk, you know, and and um, and obviously the prices come down so massively. But what I also try and do is allow like a small period, especially with um, with the actual printers that we get the shirts off, like we'll have like a quite quick turnaround with them. So we try and give like an extra week or so, just get a feel, you know? And then if there's one that's selling a bit slower, we can sort of reduce it and, and try and fix that. And if there's one selling way more, then there's still time to be able to put more on the order. You know, I think especially with COVID to see the sales of bands really go through the roof because bands still want to support them. Right. We've been able to print such high quantities and the price just drops so dramatically. And, you know, and, and we even try and sometimes if we get a new band, we even get a new, uh, shelving unit in just for them and we're like right let's fill this shelving out with them let's see what we do let's put what we've got into it let's see what a band play with or whatever and uh there's never been you know it's been sometimes where it's been a bit slower but we've never been like you know all right that that's you know been absolutely never awful. really ate shit on a on a design yeah i mean we have a couple i'm not gonna say which <laughs> yeah, one yeah. But we, we have a couple questionable designs that um definitely took a lot longer you know but maybe nobody I, knows i mean sometimes the one that you think is going to be a complete piece of shit does really well and the one that you love doesn't sell it's just you never really know yeah oh for sure you know what surprised me is um my business partner um she started doing some more sort of uh i guess you want to call it women's friendly but uh-huh. it's not it's just like 
pink shirts and and like uh, we did like a Hello Kitty rip called Hell Kitty uh-huh. and we and and she comes up with all these ideas and at first I was a little bit like is it gonna work or not and some of them just work so good because everyone just wants a black shirt right but do they really you know until you show them a death metal logo with hearts on it on a pink long sleeve right and then they realize actually you know that is unique and that is is cool and especially you know um we we get a lot more um sort of women customers and stuff that come to the store knowing they can get something a little bit better than just the album cover yeah and to, i mean for us personally the album cover t-shirts and the sort of bog standard ones are the harder ones to push they really are at the moment that's interesting i've always uh found that just like the logo you know, on a black shirt tends to do the best, but, um, you're, you're saying there's maybe a little bit too much of that. Yeah, I think so. I do think so. I think like, sometimes it can work great, but the sort of riskier ones sort of been working best for us huh. to be fair. I mean, for sure. you know, now that you mention it, I've done some kind of wacky stuff with my YouTube merch and that stuff has done uh, better than I expected it to. You know, when I do something funny and clever that I'm like, well, people will, will like this on Instagram, but they're not going to buy it, but they did buy it. So yeah. I mean, maybe, you know, maybe people want, want different stuff now. Yeah, for sure. Have I, you, I just, sorry, go ahead. I, I was just about to say, I just saw, you know, drain the band drain mm-hmm. and uh, they just did like a summer line with like a, a beach towel, like a cooler, all of that stuff, which I think you would have never seen five years ago. And now it just looks you know, it looks like it's sold out great and, you know, just really creative again with the merch. Yeah. Have you thought about um, completely vertically integrating and buying like presses and stuff? We have, but I mean, there's, it's definitely much harder than, you know, than it seems. And, and what we wanted to do, we were very close to doing that about a year and a half ago and um, then COVID hit. And we sort of took a right. step back and we were sort of like, okay, you know, um, there's sort of a lot of risk to that. I mean, I'm seeing print shops go, you know, go bust mm-hmm. all over in, in UK and in, in Europe. And uh, right now we, we have um, a great supplier that, you know, the, the guy there, that the print manager is, again, a huge fan of the music, wants to help the artist. And right now we're talking about actually sort of... Um, doing a lot more of each other in that sense, uh, investment and and sort of trying to return the favor and something in that sense, you know, but I think it's much harder than uh, right now than what people seem because of such big merch companies taking such a cut and demanding such low prices. It's just, it, it's sort of just that greed is just sort of bled into, into, I think music merchandise too much right now. And that's so, sort of what we're trying to change. So what, what's the hard part? Just that, that shit is really expensive or tell yeah. me about that labor cost. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, I see. Yeah. So there's huge, like a huge labor cost. Yeah. Uh, especially in the UK, um, like property and, and rental prices here are just absurd, you know, with taxes and everything. And, and at the end of the day, what you're going to be making back isn't always worth it in that sense. Maybe you, know? you can print your uh, shit in Russia. We, we've tried. Yeah, we definitely yeah. tried. We have. I mean, it's yeah. It, again, it's it's like um, it's a difficult one because especially in Europe, like uh, countries like Germany are just so good at it with the manufacturing, right. and are so competitive that they're even more competitive. Some suppliers that you know that we work with then then in Russia, then in China. Oh wow! Because you know, and and it's because I mean, some of these merch companies, I won't say what company, but they have um, again a huge company worth millions that is just you know offsetting all their merch printing to to a company and they're paying something crazy like 16p per print or i guess wow. like 20 cents per yeah. print and i've heard that the, a lot of the print shops are just so close to going under because they just you can't make it pay can't compete with that yeah um uh, does brexit change things for you as far as importing getting stuff in and out of the country it seems like that is a whole other layer of bullshit and cost now yeah 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 brexit has for sure i mean it's it's made things very very difficult just get getting it in um there's extra costs I, I you know it's a bit of a strange one over here because the, the sort of media isn't really talking about the extra costs. It's meant to be this whole amazing thing. Um, 
with no extra cost of this deal, but it there is, you know, there there really is, and we've seen some I mean, the stuff. The customs situation is totally different now, right? Yeah, and it, it just takes. It can taste. It sometimes it's smooth, and it will take a day. Sometimes it will take two months. Right, and it right. just can't tell because it's so new. It's very um, difficult, you know. I think in a year, and if, and, and that's hard for you um, in particular because of a band. I mean, not not now, but very soon they're going to need stuff for tour, and you can't have something hung up in customs for a month if the tour is in two weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, in, funny enough, as pretty much a project I'm working on at the moment is a. Uh, we, we, I've been putting together a solution where if a band tours, they don't have to worry and there'll be merch for them in the UK and for them in Europe at the same cost. Um, and they won't have to travel the border with, oh, with nice. any. So they don't have to pay tariffs and whatnot to get things through. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, it just, I, I'm not too sure what's going to happen. That's the thing obviously with, with COVID, but it, it sounds like it's going to be absolute mayhem trying to get across the border with any kind of goods on you. Right. Well, I don't know if anybody tuned into this expecting to hear about customs, but it's important. Like you got to think about this shit. This is like, this is, this is business. And you know, if you're in a band or if you're selling merch, that's you're, you're running a small business and this is the kind of detailed shit that you have to think about because that's the difference between potentially not having merch on your tour or not, you know, and if you don't have merch on tour, you're probably going to lose your ass. Yeah, exactly. And I think it even gets a little bit trickier because, I mean, you, you let's say you've got a nightliner, a big bus of bands all coming across the border. Does everyone have their visas? Does everyone right. have everything they need? You know, um, at the end of the day, now you need a working permit. They're not going to let you over, you know, with a, a tourist permit or anything like that. You've got, to, you've got to have so much paperwork and everything sorted now, you know, for a bus of maybe 20 guys that right. before you didn't. There was it was never thought about if you're going to make it through and no one's been able to test it either you know right I'm right not able to see what's going to happen and we still have all these tours planned and sort of just waiting quite nervously to see what was going to happen with all there's going to be some interesting shit where you know the drummer didn't fill out his paperwork right and and at the last minute it turns out he can't go on tour and what are they going to do yeah exactly exactly and i, I think i guess you guys have a slightly similar one with Canada, right? Like a lot of yeah. times a member won't, won't be able to get across. I mean, yeah. It's, yeah. That's sort of like, then? uh, well, I'm not in a band, so I, I can't say for sure, but I mean, it's the same thing. The difference is that, you know, there's, if you, if you can't play Vancouver or Toronto, that's not going to ruin your whole tour. Like nobody just tours Canada, you know? Okay. So it'd be like, let's say you couldn't play France. Well, that sucks. You had three shows in France can't play those shows that sucks but it's not gonna ruin you whereas you know if um somebody fucks up their paperwork and can't get into anywhere in europe that's a much bigger problem yeah no for sure well uh, but it ha- yeah it happens all the time and canada is very a lot more strict than other countries for example if you have like if you get um caught drunk driving five years ago they might not let you in oh wow yeah they're, really they're super strict or you know like a guy that uh, a guy I know to make a long story short um, legally had a gun on him and he was wrongly arrested for it. They dropped the charges, nothing like he didn't do anything wrong and Canada still won't let him in because of it. Um, And, you know, or people like Ronnie Radke, I strongly doubt Ronnie can get into Canada. I mean, cause he's a felon. Yes. That's crazy. I mean, we, um, We've not really spoken about this, to be honest, but um, we've been having a lot of problem with shows in Russia getting cancelled due to the police. I mean, I was just got off the phone just before this um, with our vocalist, with Alex, and uh, we've got a tour planned for September and half the shows have just been cancelled by the police have come in. They've said that um, we support, uh, I think it's propaganda of like, um, not terrorism, but propaganda of violence and and all of this and they right. took all the lyrics and everything and there've been like protests with the band just uh we just had a tour like a, a couple can of you weeks just back. bribe them <laughs> i honestly it's 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 kind of terrifying when i sure. hear alex about it because he was telling me that the cross we use we use like a orthodox crucifix sort of thing like a orthodox christian one inverted and he was saying that uh someone in his town was sort of mocking the church and did a similar thing. And he's now doing three years in prison. Wow. And, 
and we, we're, we're touring Russia, you know, and there are big shows. The Moscow show was, I think it was about 3,000 people. I'm sure, and, yeah. I, be, I bet and, Russia, I bet the Russians fucking love you guys. Yeah, it's, it's, it's wild. It, it's crazy. Yeah. And, and then to see these shows, you know, to see obviously this reaction, it's sort of reminiscent of what happened to Behemoth in, in Poland. And But the sort of difference is, is the police have pretty much actively told our tour manager, like, we don't want any problems with this, you know, to yeah. keep this to yourself you aren't playing you you're not welcome literally in this town that's it you know if you don't cause any problems for us we're not going to cause problems for you and just leave it and and uh luckily when i was talking to alex you know i said i was about to do this and i say that you know i'll probably speak about it and uh he was just like it's fine they won't understand you yeah, right. <laughs> he's you know sort of kept his his, his mouth sort of sure. shut with it because it's just like you know with family and everything and uh especially from the uk hearing that is just it's wild. It's it easy, is wild. Yeah, it's it's easy to forget that, you know, people in Russia and China and, you know, other places with essentially communist dictatorships don't have freedom of speech and they play by different rules than we do. Yeah. Yeah, it, it really is. It really is. And especially, I think, for Russia, it's, it still feels like Europe, you know. Because of the the location and and um, and obviously with Eastern Europe yeah. and these kind of, in the EU like Poland. But and, it's not Europe. No, it's not. Yeah, it's it's just an entirely different place, and you know, and I don't know the situation. I don't know how to handle those sort of things, and you know, and Alex is now trying to find out what he can do to sort of protect him and his family, and, and still try and just play music at the end of the day. You know, that's yeah. it. It's, wow, it's crazy. That's wild. Well, I hope uh, hope you guys sort all that out. Um, yeah, well, I've, I've taken up enough of your time. I want to uh, let you get on with your day, especially because it's uh, evening for you. Anything else you want to uh, mention or promote or words of wisdom to leave the kids with? Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, new album, Costalum, drops August the 13th, Friday the 13th. And uh, just definitely, I mean, if anyone's listening that is in a band, just be creative. You know, that's it. And it like you, we just spoke about, it doesn't need to be just music visuals how you run your social media how you do anything can have a twist even merch do something creative and you have a whole brand that you can build and play with it doesn't need to be just music and at the end of the day as long as you're having fun with it and it's crazy and uh, just do what you want to do and you know and that's it really the world is ever you know the world is yours if you want to go take it 